Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In sha today I'm going to talk about uh, the psychological system that exists within us and how we can um, approach and understand that system within an Islamic lens. And so it's really important to understand that. Um, it's not clicking. <laughs> okay. It's really important to understand that you know when um, we see when we study Islamic teachings that there's a constant psychological dialogue that's incorporated um, in the literature that allows us to understand the nature uh, of the human being. And so the deen, um, you know, our deen and our religion is designed towards um, the nature of a human being. And Islam's teachings are created to address and satisfy those needs. So when we study Islamic teachings, we see that they promote our spiritual facets, but they don't, um, you know, they don't disregard our biological and psychological components as well. And so what fascinated me um, always about uh, studying Islamic psychology was that, you know, one, I, I always was intrigued by how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equipped us with, um, you know, all the tools that we need to really um, live life, um, you know, with peace and with harmony and just have a, a, a level of stability. And in addition, I saw constantly how so many, so much research effort was being put into, um, you know, divulging into Eastern philosophies and um, religions and deriving a more holistic approach. Um, and very little efforts were being put into understanding what Islam has to offer into uh, for the world of psychology. Even though we have um, so many uh, you know, scholars, early scholars like, uh, you know, Al-Ghazali, Al-Kindi, Al-Razi, Ibn Sina, you know, all these scholars that contributed to um, the understanding of psychology that even uh, promoted the understanding of psychology into the Renaissance period. And so it's, you know, this understanding of psychology is not strange to Ardeen. It's fully, um, Ardeen is fully packed with a lot of the psychological tools and, um, and knowledge. And so whenever we try to understand um, any system, really, there's two main questions that we always have to ask, which is, what are the entities that make up the system? So what exists within the system? And two, how should these entities interact with each other for the system to function effectively? So our world is full of many systems. And you know, um, whether it's the solar system, the ecosystem, even within our body, there's the respiratory system, the digestive system. Right? Each system not only has its entities, but it also has a unique orbit, a unique flow. And like if we look at the solar system, for example, um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us signs of this um, orbit in many in, in a variety of ways. But if we specifically look at the solar system, we'll see that you know the planets revolve around the sun, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed the sun to be the only entity, right? with the strongest gravitational pull to keep the planets in that orbit around it. And if the planets revolved around anything else, there would be chaos and there would be disruption. And this is the same case with any of the other systems. There's a certain flow. And when these entities are not in the designed um, flow, there's always a level of distress. And so first step is to, the first question was, what are the entities, right? And so quickly, you know, we have the physical body, um, we have a ruh which we know to be our soul, um, our spirit, the qalb, which is our inner spiritual heart. This is the main tool that we utilize to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, you know, its purpose is to seek God, and that's the way it was designed. And then we have our nafs. This is the part of ourselves that, this is the pleasure and desire seeking part of ourselves. This is the part of ourselves that contains the lower drives. And then we have our aql, which is the intellect and cognition. And if you notice here, I didn't say brain, right? Because Islamic psychology actually um, understands aql to be um, not confined to just one organ, not the brain. It actually, the concept of cognition and intellect from an Islamic perspective is not just confined to the brain. It actually is also um, within the heart. So both our brain and heart have the ability to process and understand information in their own way. And we see this constantly in the Quran, um, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes, he refers, when he talks about contemplation and reflection, understanding, he sometimes refers to the brain, but other times he refers to our heart. And if we see here from these three ayat, we'll see that there's an association between 
our heart and the ability to reason, our heart and the ability to understand, our heart and the ability to contemplate and reflect. And, um, you know, this is a constant reminder that, you know, the intellect, the ability of, um, the ability of intellect and cognition is not just limited to our mind. And, you know, I find, I find that the understanding of the psychological system is really beneficial for clients because you can't know how to navigate your way without knowing your, your design, you know, without knowing what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put within you and the tools he gave you within you to navigate your way. So understanding, you know, that we have this nafs, this ego-containing self, right, this desire-seeking part of ourselves, often referred to as a child within us. You know, a child throws a temper tantrum when um, they don't get their way, right? And we do this we do this as adults in different ways. We can get angry. We have all these different reactions, you know, when the ego doesn't get its comfort, right, when the nafs doesn't get what it, what it wants. We have our brain. It, you know, um, the brain is it's constantly interacting with the environment through our senses, right? Your, our senses are the first mode of interaction with the environment. It's constantly collecting information um, through our hearing and through our sight. And the brain is constantly collecting that information and processing it. And this, this understanding, you know, is empowering because it shows us, you know, that we have a choice in what we expose our senses to, that it's a personal trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And so, um, and, and, you know, there's the power of, there's a process also of reflection and perception that our brain um, has the ability to do. And then we have the heart, the qalb, which seeks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has the ability to decipher truths and meanings from life circumstances. Um, and the state of our soul and ruh has a reflection of the state of our heart and its level of connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, laying out these this, this, um, this um, these entities within us helps us understand the role that each of them play in our lives. It helps us. It helps the client understand the role they play in regulating these uh, components within themselves. A lot of times, there's a level of distress, but we don't know what is it. You know, is, is it you know is it coming from? Is it a heart issue? Is it uh, my nafs? Is it you know what am I um, what am I exposing myself to? You know, like as far as my hearing, my sight. Um, you know, what am I collecting? What is the inf what are the what is the information that I am um, I'm collecting essentially? And so, um, we these are the entities, and we answered the first question. Um, and the second question is, what is the design flow? And we were when I refer to the solar system, I talked about how the sun was the center of that flow. Um, from an Islamic psychological perspective, the heart is the king of this system. And every other component in the system is there to serve the heart. And the heart, because the heart is essentially the strongest and main tool within us that's designed to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and fulfill our purpose. And the key here is that when the heart is connected to its source, there's an unveiling that happens. That, you know, the closer you get to Allah, Allah continues to lift veils and veils from your heart, allowing you to perceive meanings and further understanding from our life circumstances that sometimes our, our, our brain is um, limited and, um, and cannot do that. And so if we look at this picture here, um, we see that the ego um, is taking up pretty much a big portion of the picture, and so is the brain. And we see the heart is pretty much subservient to the ego and the brain. And the brain looks oppressive. It's carrying a stick, um, and it's, you know, abusing the heart. And unfortunately, this is actually a reflection of what our system looks like when it's in a level of distress, right? And this is the Islamic psychological perspective, is that there's a certain alignment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala designed our system to be aligned a certain way. And that, you know, and, and this dialogue is a little strange um, to Western thought because, you know, we idolize the mind in our culture. Um, we idolize this idea of intelligence. You know, we think that the mind should have all the answers. And the mind, we have, you know, you see little cartoons where, um, you know, the brain is like yelling, at, uh, similar to this one actually, where the brain is telling the, the heart, I told you better, right? I told, uh, I told you so in that, you know, that the brain knew better. And so, um, you know, we're changing the dialogue here, and the dialogue here is saying that no, there's this part within us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created that's actually, you know, very strong and has the ability to decipher meanings. That it's not just the brain that can do that. And and I'll I'll explain later why introducing this concept um, has a direct effect on a person's understanding of their struggles as well. 
And so this um, idea or this concept that the heart is the king, um, there are signs that reflect the reality of our heart's position within our deen. For example, when we look at sujood, right, we put our forehead to the ground. And in that forehead area, you know, that's the part of the, our brain. It's called the frontal lobe. And that part of our brain is the part that is, um, is responsible for high executive functioning. That's the part of our brain that differentiates us from animals. And yet, in this most noble and truest positions, right, where we are closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this alignment, we can see that the heart is higher than our brain, right? And so there's, there's, this, there's a sign in that, you know, showing us where the position of where our heart really stands. Also, another a great example is in Ramadan. You know, in Ramadan, we gain a sense of stability. We gain a sense of, um, you know, harmony that we, um, we get just from where everything is aligned in Ramadan. I mean, in Ramadan, we're depriving our nafs. So the nafs is weaker. Our egos are weaker because we're more conscious of what we're saying. We're more conscious of, you know, if we're fueling our nafs or our heart. And at the same time, we're few, we're more conscious of what we expose our senses to, of what we say, of what we uh, what we look at, what we hear. Um, and this fuels our brain with positive knowledge and the remembrance of Allah. And you know, and that in itself is serving the heart during this month. And so. When the nafs is being deprived and the brain is being utilized to serve the heart, then you know the heart steps up to the front lines, and then we experience the stability and like the sense of the level of harmony when things within our psychological system are are aligned the way that they should be. And so, in therapy, you're explaining that the con you're you're essentially um, explaining the concept that the heart is the king, not the brain, right? And, um, you know, this concept brings to the client's awareness of the burden that we put on our mind to figure out everything. And there's an exhaustion and a burdensome weight when we are living as if the mind is, is the king. And, you know, we go through situations in life where, you know, we pro where we process, we, like say we have a problem, right? We process, our brain processes all the information that's in front of us, and sometimes our brain comes back and with a solution, right? We have a solution to the problem. So, okay, one plus one equals two, right? But there are times when, you know, our brain processes all the information that's in front of us and then comes back with no answer. So we tell our brain, think again, think again, you know, you know calculate again, process again. And it comes back with nothing. And so when we're only on a mental level, right, then, you know, we we put this burden on our brain constantly to think again, and we obsess over that, you know. Um, and so, um, you know, existential psychology, which is very in line with, um, it has a lot of common ground with Islamic psychology, it says that suffering occurs when we're unable to derive meaning from our pain. And, you know, there's an understanding that pain and suffering are two different things. You know, there's a saying that pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. You know, pain is always going to happen. Um, and there are, but, you know, being, staying only on a mental level without allowing our heart to gain strength and take the lead, our mind will always fall short in deriving meaning um, from our difficult experiences. And, you know, um, I, I, and, you know, I had a client ask me, you know, how can there be, any meaning from bad experiences. I mean, bad experiences are bad experiences. But this was a client that I had, and this was a very um, rewarding experience for me to see how important it is to explain the, these concepts. Because, you know, to, to explain to her that she was, you know, to, to allow her to facilitate a process where she can see that she's only on the, on the mental level, right? That there was a disconnect there from the mind and the heart. And that, you know, there's a lack of confusion about this, all the entities that are within us. I mean, there's a, a level of confusion about the entities that exist within us. And so when you're only on the mental, on when everything is, you're dependent on the mind, you know, to figure out everything, um, you know, there's, there's a level of burden that we experience. And so it's really important to explain this concept and to, and to allow them to understand that there are tools within them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equipped, uh, equipped them with that are empowering, that have the ability to, um, you know, that when connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that have the ability to, you know, derive meaning and understanding in, in a different way of their experience. And, you know, um, we know the ayah in the Qur'an, in the ma'al asri yusra, with hardship comes ease, you know. It's not, it's not necessarily that after hardship comes ease, it's that through the hardship there is ease, there is meaning, there is understanding um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows upon us. And, um, and so it's really important to um, identify these 
entities because you can't communicate something clearly unless you can identify it. And helping a client recognize these entities within themselves aids them in increasing their self-awareness. Um, and so many times we'll refer, we'll say things about ourselves when we don't really know which part of ourselves is communicating that idea. So, you know, a lot of times we'll say like, I want this or that, or I like this or that, or I hate this or that, right? But which part of us hates that thing? Which part of us likes that thing? Is it our heart that seeks a law that hates that thing? Or is it our nafs, our desire-seeking self that's saying that? Is it our ego? Um, you know, so differentiating between these things allows for a dialogue to exist where a person understands these entities within themselves and which and and just a heightened sense of self and of and, and a heightened sense of understanding of their needs and their wants. And being able to identify these entities helps them um, communicate it uh, further. So, um, and then in order for, so we said the mind is there to serve the heart, right? But there is a crucial factor that needs to take place in order for the heart to be served by the mind. And that's the mind needs to be present. They say depression is often associated with our mind being consumed by the past. And anxiety often associated with our mind being consumed by the future. And so if our mind is in the past and in the future, it's not in the present. And that's where our heart needs it to be in order to be fueled. So the heart gets malnourished when the mind is off somewhere else in the future and the past or in the past. And, you know, understanding um, this importance of being present is really important to activate for the activation of the heart. Um, and, you know, this concept relates a lot to mindfulness therapy, uh, which isn't a surprise because a lot of um, mindfulness, uh, a lot of mindfulness uh, therapy concepts are based of, you know, they, they reference Rumi's teachings a lot. And, you know, if you study Rumi's teachings, a lot of it is very centered around the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love of the Rasul And, you know, in, mindful, in mindfulness therapy, you're teaching the client to play the role of the witness. Um, being in control of their thoughts, emotions that come in and out of even moments of our day. You know, we're constantly thinking um, and we're constantly having thoughts and we're having emotions. And, you know, when you are present and when you play this role of the witness, you know, and, and you realize that the mind is not the king, you don't give power to every thought you have, right? You don't give, you don't halt to every emotion that you have. And, of course, this is something that, you know, it's a process that has to be learned that takes, it's not something that comes easy. Um, but, you know, getting the client to, to understand the role of the mind, you know, it, it allows them to see that not every thought I have, you know, is true. You know, not every thought that I have, you know, it means that it's, um, necessarily a reflection of my state. Just because I think that something bad is going to happen, it's not a reflection of my reality. But this can only happen when we understand that the mind is not the king. But if we idolize the mind and we, we idolize the brain as the know-it-all of everything, right? As the, you know, the the highest functioning, um, uh, you know, the, the you know, the crutch that we, we depend on all the time, you know, to figure out everything, then this idea is not going to be um, understood clearly. But when we understand that, you know, the mind is there to serve a function and it's there to process and understand the world, but to serve the heart essentially, then we can get, you know, we can allow for a conversation to take place where we, you know, we can see things for what they really are. And, you know, the past and the future, they're, you know, they're illusions, you know, and um, current illusions. So when the only reality that exists is really the present, right? And to help them stay in that reality um, is a constant effort that a therapist would, would take uh, with a client in helping them, you know, um, strive towards um, being present with their mind and allowing their mind to feed their heart. Um, I, uh, an example of this, you know, I had a client who, um, you know, had a lot of struggle when it comes to prayer. And so, you know, every time, they, they, you know, they'd really long to pray, but when they get to prayer, you know, their mind just consumed their thoughts and their, you know, their thoughts consumed the entire um, prayer. And, you know, a lot of times when we talk about this, we often attribute it attribute that struggle to shaitan and we say it's because of shaitan and although shaitan's presence is there of course but you know there is a there is a personal responsibility you need to take as well um, and so it empowers this dialogue empowers the role to 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 go to prayer with your heart right and not with your not with all of these thoughts and in your mind 
And so, um, you know, a lot of times we dismiss that struggle, right, when we say, you know, we say just because of shaitan, but there's a role that we play too, and it's because we put so much emphasis on the mind. So, like, you know, I remember with this client, we talk about how, you know, initially they, their heart wants to pray, right? They, their heart is longing for prayer, and then they get to prayer. And, you know, their, their heart is trying to be present, but what does the mind do? You know, you didn't say that fatha very well. You know, you didn't say it again or, um, you know, you know, of course, a lot of this could be shaitan, but there's also a level when we don't train our mind, when we're when we let our thoughts take control of us and not the opposite, and we don't have we don't um, we don't learn that practice. It can be very easy for our heart, our mind, to also be the king of that prayer, and not our heart can lack that connection during prayer and not receive that connection during prayer. So, getting the the client to stay present um, is difficult initially, but it's very possible. It's just strange um, for them, but it's like you know, it's like working out a muscle that you never worked out before. You know, it's it's not something that will come easy initially, but I found that understanding these um, psychological concepts and understanding the way these entities work within us helps a lot. Um, in prayer, helps a lot in being present, being uh, more present in our lives and um, and just uh, to take a more active and pers uh, take more personal responsibility in our lives. And so, you know, I'll end with this where the Rasul says, there lies within the body a piece of flesh and if it is sound, the whole body is sound and if it's corrupted, the whole body is corrupted. Barely, this uh, piece is the heart, and so there, there is a constant emphasis on um, our heart and its condition being reflective of the condition of our entire being, and so, and finally, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. So, Jazakumallah khair.